Well, hi everybody and welcome to a very special Kings of Anglia podcast video cast as well. You can see who, the, who I'm joined by here on the video. Um, but it's a podcast um, that I hope you're going to enjoy listening. So we're joined by um, a player who, <coughs> well, in a very short space of time at Ipswich Town Football Club made a very big impression. There's no doubt about that. Um, 75 games, 27 goals, joined in 2000. And by the time he left, Ipswich had enjoyed two of the greatest seasons um, in recent history. Um, he led the Premiership goal-scoring charts for a while in his time here. And, um, well, it's just great that he's here. He played in total 660 games in the league. Um, and it's funny because when people talk about legends of teams, it's not often you would say a person who's only been there a couple of seasons would be classed as a legend. But this man made such an impression. He certainly was. It's Marcus Stewart. Marcus, great to uh, see you and listen to you. Um, how are you keeping? Hi, everyone. Uh, very good. Yeah, yeah. Steady away, you know, I'm pretty, um, uh, got through COVID okay, you know, psychologically, family okay. So, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of people that are worse off than I've been in during COVID. So I'm pretty lucky, really. Um, now we're just getting through it, of course. So everyone's looking forward to a new season in football. I'm personally looking for look, looking forward to a new season in rugby because my boys play rugby. So I'm going to, oh. um, so, yeah, a lot of good things coming up over the next couple of months. The Euros, of course, the Champions League final. It's a lot of nice things. And not a lot of maybe holidays for people, who knows? Maybe somewhere different in Portugal. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a nice, some nice things to look forward to at the moment from, from, from everyone's point of view. I think, I think everyone's looking forward, forward to a new football season, hopefully with a bit of normality. Yeah, I think you're right there, Marcus. Very much so. I mean, I don't know about you, but do you, do you listen to football matches with the sound with the crowd noise on or off? I I keep it on, but I've got to have it on. Yeah, yeah. Even though when you have, there's a shot and there's a ten minute delay with the crowd <laughs> the shot, yeah. but it's, you still need it on. I can't. You know, I'm used to watching training and taking training and having practice games behind closed doors, and it's soulless to be honest with you. So. Oh. Last thing I want to do is watch a game is, uh, with no crowd. I think everyone, I think everyone in, with the playoffs recently um, starting, of course, and obviously the last week in the Premier League with crowds in the stadium just made it so much more atmosphere and um, a bit more exciting, really. Mm, couldn't agree more. Always makes me smile. Always makes me laugh when um, when there's no crowd. When we don't have any crowd noise and somebody swears, the old F word comes out, and the poor old commentators on it straight. Away. We apologise for any. And I sit there thinking, well, what do you? We don't. We're not bothered. We're watching. We understand. <laughs> there's some people that are bothered. I don't get that. You know, <laughs> it, you know, it's a it's a sport, and you know, there's no no crowd. You're gonna hear things like that. You probably hear yeah. worse crowd when the game's on. You know, <laughs> when they come back. You know, let alone the players. So. It's just part of the sport, you know. It's an emotional thing, and you know, I say the commentator shouldn't have, shouldn't have to apologise for stuff, stuff like that. No, okay. it gets crazy. Well, talk, well, talk, talk. And it's, it's lovely to catch up with you, Marcus. And of course, um, we'll talk about um, so many things. Hopefully, in the next in the next forty five minutes to hour or so. Um, and of course, talking of, of commentators and media and stuff, Marcus, you're doing a bit more media now. We hear you here in um, in Ipswich on, on BBC Radio Suffolk. You do a little bit of commentate, co commentating. Um, uh, you, you obviously enjoy it. Um, how did you get into? How did that come about then? Um, um, Brennan just called me, Brennan Woolley, and just said, "Do you fancy doing some? some you know, we're down down your way. I'm, I'm not sure what game. I think it was Plymouth or or someone like that. Do you fancy coming along and doing the game?" And um, it just went from there, really. You know, I just said I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I love my opinion. I love I love talking about football. I try to break it down for people, so it's not just the normal cliches. You know, um, try and paint a picture if I can, um, and I like it. Yeah, um, obviously the season finished now. Couldn't do a lot towards the end of the season because COVID restrictions were even more tighter uh, with away games. So hopefully next year he invites me back. And off the back of that, I've done a bit for BBC Bristol as well um, with Bristol Rovers. So, so yeah, I, I really enjoy it. It's, it gets me going to games and it. Uh, and it keeps me thinking about the games because you know it's really hard for me personally to watch a game and not try to break it down. You know, it's really hard for me to watch it as a fan and just enjoy it, enjoy the goals, enjoy the atmosphere. Um, I can't do that. I, I, I look for, I pick holes and um, that's just how it works. So it's quite nice to do it on a, 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 and actually tell people what I'm thinking at the time. And you're right. You say these things do lead to other things, don't they, Mark? As you said about, about you know, um, with BBC in, in Bristol. I mean, suddenly you get a few phone calls here and there to, and it's great that it keeps, keeps you in football, doesn't it? It's, that's what it's all about. Yeah, it's, it's quite nice, you know, um, it's, it gets me watching games when, um, when you know, a lot of people can't go to the games as well. And it gives me a, an, an opinion to 
to shape my opinion about and and people to listen to. I do try and break it down a bit if I can uh, and paint a picture. That's what I try to do. Um, and, but at the moment, I've enjoyed it. But let's see what goes on with that next season. Uh, we've got another, obviously another month or two before it starts. You get the friendly games, of course, pre-season games, and see what happens then. But yeah, it's for, for the ch- the time during lockdown. It kind of it helped quite a lot, really. Now, it'd be very amiss of me not to help out my non-league friends here um, at Berry Town Football Club because Berry Town, a good, good, great non-league club here, well, lots of great non-league clubs here. And, and you're going to be doing a, um, a night with Marcus Stewart at Berry Town at Ram Meadow, I believe, in the next month. Um, with uh, uh, ooh, I think it's J- July. July the 1st. July the 1st, I think. Hey, that, yeah. Um, July the 1st. So, uh, yeah, I'm going up to do that. And... Um... Come along, just talk, just have a chat. Uh, open to anything. I'm pretty laid back. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'd be it'd be a good night. Um, Kieran, I've done a couple with Kieran McGill a few times. Um, so yeah, it, it, I'm looking forward to it. It's a bit of a journey up, but you know, I'll stay overnight and uh, come back the next day. So I'm looking forward to going up there. I, I don't know how many people are going to be going there, if I'm honest. But um, more the merrier, really. It'll just be a relaxed evening, if I'm honest. I think there'll be quite a few. I think I'll be pretty sold out, Marcus, I would suggest. But I know you can still get tickets. Um, but, I mean, is this, is this something? I mean, have you, you say you've done a few. Do you, do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy just – you've always been a good good with fans, though, haven't you? You've, you've always liked the fans and chatting. See, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty laid back. And I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll chat with anyone about anything. And that's that's what type of nights I have, you know. I'm not I'm not there to – to get drunk and be a, a, a lout, you know, like the, the old, the, the old days um, <laughs> used to happen, not myself, but, you know, I can see, I can imagine back in the day or even now it might happen where, you know, people go to nights like that and just see it as a free drink and, you know, yeah. just fool themselves a bit. I'm there to just have a laugh really and, and chat yeah. about all times as honestly as I can. Um, some questions I might swerve, some I might answer. You might be surprised. <laughs> So when right, so let's take you all the way back. Then, when you were a kid, did you think you'd be a pro footballer, Marcus? Uh, well, no one expects to be, um, but I knew I always liked football. You know, we used to play on our local green, turn up on a Sunday. One street would turn up with five or six players, aged between five and eighteen, and we turn up, same sort of age group, and then we split the teams, and then it was first to twenty, and if it was over after about ten minutes, we'd do it again. Yeah. You know, generally on a Sunday and that's how it all started really and then boys clubs and then and then from boys clubs people start to notice you but mm-hmm. did I actually so it went on from there really and then obviously Bristol Rovers and Ipswich Huddersfield um it just goes from there you don't I don't think you know at the time I think once you think you're good and you're scoring goals at whatever level you kind of you're not in the system you, you're just thinking about loving and enjoying football like most kids do mm. and from there onwards you know it was i'd never had my parents in my ear saying you know you got to do this you got to do that you can earn this money you can earn that that wasn't how it was i was mm. i was pretty just played football that was it no one no one told me in my ear what i could be so i had no hype to believe which is a lot a lot of time these days mm. a lot of people are money money orientated and the football comes second so if your football's good, your money's going to come with it. That's how it works. Um, so I was never, ever, never, ever thought about money. I just thought about loving football. And from that that time onwards, it became a job. And then, mm. but I still loved it, of course. So I was getting paid eventually for something that I loved doing anyway. Mm. Uh, I would have done at whatever level until the probably age I retired anyway at 38. So I was a lucky man. I just had mm. a talent. I had left foot, and left footed players are quite special. Um, generally, I know there's right footed players are as well, but left footed players are technique wise are pretty good. So I, was, I realized was, the older you get, that you, you have a left foot. Maradona had one, uh, Messi's got one, you know, Beckham wishes he had one. <laughs> so, yeah, I was pretty lucky and uh, it just, I, enjoy, I enjoyed it. I, I, dreams come true and they did for me. 
Now, now tell tell me when you when you're a youngster, did you? Because I mean, obviously Ipswich Town. When he saw when he saw him for a couple of seasons, Marcus, but it seemed like a lifetime. It was so wonderful, great, great, great period of the club's history. And um, t- tell me, back in the day, did you just to sort of dance around goalkeepers and, and things like do like sort of stuff you did? I mean, because you were just so composed and it was just looked so natural. Was it? I remember a time, and it's and I always reflect on this time. Um, and it was never taught to me. It was no one ever coached me into how to go around goalkeepers. But I remember when I was, you know, I was gone about when I used to play on the green with friends and stuff like that. I remember one game. I did it in that game. Um, and I was, I must have been, I'm trying to think now, I must have been around about between seven and nine years old when I did it. Um, but, I remember doing it at the time, going around the goalie. The goalie must have been about 18 years old. Went around, scored a goal, jumpers for goalposts, that kind of... Yeah, yeah. And that was it. But from that moment onwards, I've ne- it's probably etched in my head that I scored in that situation. But I didn't, I didn't know what to assess before the goal. I just did it. Um, and I, I, su- I suppose from that moment, it's kind of subconsciously in my head to do it when the time's right. Mm. For most times I've done it, it's been the right time to do it. I've been quite a couple of times where I've tried to go around the goalkeeper, and he's, but generally it's worked for me. Um, and I, I don't know why, it's just an instinct that I don't think you can coach that sort of thing. No, it's an instinct. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. You just, you just, you just, well, being a very, very poor average midfield player, I never actually got the opportunity to attempt it. But I mean, you're right. I mean, players, I if you just watch it, you, you either naturally do it or you don't. But it was tremendous. It was tremendous. Watch. So, so you, yeah, I suppose you were obviously you're at Bristol, and and then I suppose to be fair, quite a big break came at Huddersfield. Really, I think Huddersfield. Would you be fair to say, sort of gave you that? That's where you perhaps became far more prominent in in the game, but at that level. Uh, well, I was it. Well, Bristol Rovers were in League Division. Got relegated from Division Division Two, which is a Championship now, uh, and then they're in Division One, which is now League One. Mm. Sorry, Division Three, which is Division Three. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was scoring goals for the previous two seasons. I was 22, 23 years old. Um, I just felt it was time to leave. You know, it was the, the end of the, I think it was Bosman time as well. I just kicked in, or was close to kicking him. And from my point of view. I just wanted to leave and go somewhere else, not because I didn't like Bristol Rovers. It was just time to move on, mm. see a bit of the country, um, not stay in my bubble in Bristol, which I could have done all my life, which mm. I see a lot of Bristolians do, ex, ex-players and players, um, and become a small fish in a big pond. And that's what I wanted to do. I've become mm. big fish, a big fish, small pond at Bristol. Time to move on. Mm. Uh, and it was the best thing I ever did. You know, I... Yeah, I don't look back and I'm pretty easy with getting on with people and pretty easy to get on with someone in different parts of the country. It didn't, didn't affect me whatsoever. It was, it, I embraced it and you know, I, mm. I didn't know what to expect, don't get me wrong. Mm. But looking back, it was every move was to a different part of the country, whether it's Huddersfield, Ipswich, Sunderland. Brilliant, loved it. Mm. Loved it's it. funny because because Huddersfield were right up there, weren't they, with Ipswich in the, in well, the championship? Thought, for a couple of seasons, you know, we struggled a bit. Uh, and the season I left, you know, we, like I say, we, I think we were one one place above Ipswich. Or it kept, yeah. kept changing after after every week. But we were both up there. Yeah, you're right. Um, so, yeah, that that we all know the story. Some people might not, which I'll go into it in a minute if you want me to. But that was a strange time, yeah, because we, we like I say, for us to sell someone um, uh, on the back of that. And I wasn't, I was quite a good lad in the dress room. I had a good laugh. I got on with most people. So mm. I wasn't a bad egg. Um, so it, it baffles me to this day, really, why, why they sell me. And I think it still baffles a few Huddersfield fans, if I'm honest. I, I think it does. And you've only got to read, you've only got to look back at that, at that period. I mean, it's 20 odd years ago now, but you've got to look at that period and Huddersfield fans were left incandescent. I remember I was I was editor of the Greenan, which we'll get onto in a minute, Marcus, because you did a fantastic column in the Greenan. Um, and I remember uh, someone contacted me because we had a letter come in saying, why have Ipswich Town spent all this money on Marcus Stewart? You know, well, don't read really know much about him. And 
people went and a phone call from someone in Huddersfield who said, You've just signed yourself a 20 gold a year guaranteed man who will work his socks off, blah, blah. He couldn't be high enough praise. He said, You got it for an absolute steal. And of course, Ipswich fans never really didn't know much about you, but of course, that's went on to be the case. Yeah, I mean, I still get people in Huddersfield because I, I, I live up this way, uh, yeah. time to time, um, coming up to me now and speaking to me about it, you know, and it's yeah. still in their memories. Oh, God, I don't, I don't know what year it was, 99, was it? Or 2000? It was, yeah, well, 2000, the beginning yeah. of 2000, wasn't it? Yeah. So 21 years ago. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's still, still quite clear in, the, in, in a lot of the Huddersfield Times fans' minds. Um, but like you say, off the back of it, time to go. And, and I look mm. back at that move, of course, and it, it was the right thing to do again. Oh, absolutely. And of course, you know, we, I mean, obviously the Ipswich years, I mean, it was, it was probably, I, I don't know how you how you rate them up there. I mean, they must be, I mean, you obviously went to Sunderland as well, but I mean, the Ipswich, again, I keep saying this, you're only here a couple of seasons, but it seemed like a lifetime. It was, so much happened, didn't it, in that, in that short well, I think period? Half season, I think I joined in January and then stayed to the end. I think it was two and a half seasons. Yeah. Two and a half. Oh, no, it might have been almost three because... Um, obviously, we had the full, the half of the year in the Championship where we got promoted, then a full, full year in the Premier League where we done really well, second year in the Premier League where we did do so well, but, and then I was around for the pre season after that for a little while. All right. I left, I think, in the August of that mm. transfer, so last deadline day, I think it was, to Sunderland. So almost, almost three years, really. Yeah. Uh, two years and eight months from that. So, yeah. It, I think the, the shelf life of footballers isn't that long at clubs anyway. You know, you, you normally sign them to sign a three-year contract or four, mm. and you might see that out. But generally, do you sign on for another three or four years? Yeah. yeah. The shelf life of a footballer at a football club is around about that time. And my history tells me that that was about my time as well. Apart from Bristol Rovers, I was at most clubs for three or four years. Two yeah. or four. Yeah. You know, Huddersfield, similar time, three years. Ipswich three years, um, Sunderland three back three. So it, it was that that was kind of my shelf life. I, I was done and dusted after that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, at Ipswich Towns, we said um, he scored some terrific goals, Marcus. I mean, can I mean, well, I think I said something twenty seven, but they all seem fantastic. Um, one or two, one or two of the best for me. Yeah. Um, oh. I think you always remember your debut goal away to Barnsley. Always, mm. always remember that. That's when I knew I could fit into the team because Jim Magilton had an eye for a pass to someone like me. Um, um, and of course, you know, you can forget the, the playoff game goals and the Wembley goals. Mm. Now, to break them down into terms of which one do I like the both, the, which one is my best goal out of those? I would say they're all as important as each other. I would say the first and second goal at um, away to Bolton were, especially the first one. I know it was a, um, we were two 0 down at the time, and we were on the back foot. The momentum was, was with Bolton, and off the back of that goal, the momentum became with us. Mm. And I think we took that into the second leg a bit. Really, I mean, I, I missed a sitter in that game as well to get myself a hat trick to take us take it back to three two to back to Portman Road. But you know, but the most memorable game and, and I, I, was the, the second leg of that game <laughs> as a team and, and the drama in it, the sending off, the fouls, the last last minute goals, the penalties from Jamie Clapham, of course. It's just mm. had pure drama in it. You know, mm. Jim Gilton scoring the only hat trick he's ever scored in his career <laughs> in the biggest game in the club's and his and mine, mine as a player history. Mm. Um, uh, not previous history for Ipswich, of course. No, no, but I know what you mean. Yeah, current. Yeah, yeah, when you. So it was just that game was the most dramatic I've ever played in. That's for sure. Um, but then Wembley brings its own type of pressures, doesn't it? You know. Mm. We went a goal down a game. We went a goal down or two in every game, two playoff mm. and the final, and we ended up winning them. So it shows the character we had in the team, and that came from team spirit, by the way. That's yeah. what um, George Boy is some brilliant lads as as people as well, and we got on 
we had some great times and that kind of got us through and was that extra different um percentages that that got us through games i think you know we were willing to stick through to stick with each other and so yeah that 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 all for all those three games for different reasons um the wembley goal yeah it, it was a good goal it was a great cross i knew what jim was going to do but i don't think it was as important as the ones at bolton well it's funny you say that because um i believe every every sort of april or whatever it's it falls on that that second that first leg game. Um, it's still referred to as Marcus Stewart Day here yeah. in Ipswich because it was. You're on the same day. I'm like, oh, it's my day. Is it? Okay. <laughs> you see that as well. Yeah, it's. Well, but that's. I'm not on anything like that, but I get the yeah. R and they just send it on to me. So it's quite nice, actually. Yeah, keep it going. I quite like it. Once a year, it reminds me of those <laughs> times. I, I can't see it ever being changed, Marcus, because it was extraordinary. Because the thing was, of course, it should have been so close. You weren't there when they'd been so close for so long. I mean, I think that was the thing. Um, it was about the fourth attempt, I think. So this was this was a combination of, oh, here we go again. You know, um, oh my God, I don't believe it. Here we go again for another time. We're going to get out two 0 down, and then bang. You know, going back to what you just said about getting so close, I remember playing for other teams and you know watching Ipswich. I don't know who was playing, but watching Ipswich in those playoffs games and, you know, not not getting to the, the next level, which was the final, of course, and missing out on away goals, I think it was the season before. Or so. yeah. And they, they binned them off for us, for our game, from our, for our playoffs. Um, so, so unfortunate. So when I did sign, that was kind of, that was a big pull for me to, I actually thought I could make a difference to actually get up his, automatically because we had time to do that, or to take us to the next step and get, get us to the final. As it happened, we went another step again to win it. So, but I do remember, and I remember it vividly thinking I could be the difference here, and I really backed myself to be that difference. Um, so, yeah, and even in the final, when we went a goal down and rightly missed saved the penalty in a crucial time of the game, I still believe we, we, we'd win it. Even even when we play Bolton at home and Margot when he goes up front and nods down for Jim who scores his hat trick, even two minutes, three minutes before that, I still believed. I really did. Just, you just, I can't explain what how, but you just mm. know that it's your year. And I, yeah. I don't know how, you just do, and it mm. and it was, and it was. That's it. That team spirit, I think, as you mentioned earlier, Marcus. That's obviously that was obviously absolutely crucial and absolutely key um, to everything. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Uh, no doubt about it. You know, I think team spirit has to be spot on. I think that comes with, with results. It comes with the type of character you bring in. You have to do your homework, recruitment. I know that because I've been involved in it as a coach since since a mm. player. So, and I would say all the teams I've been successful at have had a great team spirit. Yeah. Great team spirit. And, you know, I don't think you can, can create it like... Back in the day, you know, we used to go out and be on maybe on a Tuesday, maybe on a Saturday. That was how you, you kind of bonded. I think these days it's changed a bit. Um, so, but I still, I still speak to people within the game, and we all, I always say, you know, the best teams that they were in and we were in and I was in. It kind of there's a pattern that, that it was all about, not all about team spirit, but that 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 got you through the tough times. Now, be honest. You can be honest with me now, Marcus, 20 years on. Mm. Had you ever heard of the Ipswich Greenan when you were asked to do a column in the Ipswich Greenan by myself or whoever was a club at the time? You must have heard of the Greenan. There was, a, there was a paper in Bristol called the Greenan. Yes. So I've heard of the Greenan and that was it. You know, because <laughs> it, was a, it was a paper that used to come out almost almost straight away as soon as the results were finished. It came out straight yeah. away. And that was a Greenan and it was green. It was a green paper. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously, when Ipswich asked me to do the, the con, I've heard of the green, but obviously I've not heard of the Ipswich green because I'm not not from yeah. there. But I've heard of the green paper, yes, for sure. It was. I get mean, it, 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 we, we, sorry. To get news out quick to the public as soon as you mm. can. Not wait till Monday. Not read mm. the news at all back in the day and the Sunday sun, whatever you read on a Sunday. It was there for you Saturday afternoon, straight as soon as the game finished. 
Now, of course, we had your column in there because you used to sit and do it with me sometimes. We used to sit and talk. And we ended up having an Ask Marcus Stewart email. We created one. And we had pages of these little questions. And it used to come in the office. I mean, those sort of things would just never go on today, would they? I mean, it was, it was a great credit to you and the football club, you know, that they trusted journalists and players to get along and chat and, and just and do stuff, which, of course, it was the fans who benefited because they loved seeing it all. Um, great. You know, things have changed so much on that front. Yeah, they do. I mean, and it's strange. As a as a player, as a player, um, I quite enjoy doing that. But looking back, it was I had to give information on what was going on in training and stuff like that. You know, inside information. And I sometimes used to get a bit of stick off the lads because if Stewie, what is that for? you know, which is because some lads are private, some aren't. Some are on Instagram, some aren't. Some want to keep themselves to to themselves, some aren't. Some people don't mind the information going out, some aren't. So at the time, I just didn't care, really, if I'm honest with you. Um, but looking back now, I probably think I should, should, should have kept held back on one of two things. But no, I, I enjoyed it. And like you say, it kind of did help with our calls in, in Get Promoted. It actually brought, instead of players having a good team spirit, there was a great team a spirit around the club. And if I helped to do that, I didn't consciously do it to do that, then bring. It probably did, really. Um because all news was positive and there was a bit of inside yeah. information that, you know, you probably wouldn't get back then. Whereas now, everyone knows everything because it's social media. So, yeah, I think it helped. And if I um, gave out a little bit more information than I should have done, chaps, if you're watching any of the ex-players, sorry. <laughs> I don't think, I can't remember anything too dramatic coming out, but anyway. Um, no, no, course, that... it, wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it's was, it was pretty lighthearted stuff. But it yeah, good, it was. Good insight from, from, from the fans' point of view. I know the fans loved it, but uh, and of course that sees very quick before we move on to to, to further up up your football and, uh, career and, and your future ahead. And of course, yeah, England was England the England call up, Marcus. You must have had this hundred thousand million times. You know how close you were to an England call up, and I know you were quite cool about it and quite relaxed. But you really were. You must have been close. You were just in the middle of some very good strikers at the time, weren't you? I was. Yeah, that that was that was that 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 that's just life, isn't it? You know, you can't. Do a lot about it now. If you look at you know look, look the England squad these days, look at the strikers they've got. Yeah, Patrick Bamford can't get a look in. You know, no. it's the climate of things. It's just how it is. The cycle of football. If you're around, um, like Patrick Bamford is at the moment, and he's got Calvert Lewin, Harry Kane, Danny Ings, all ahead of him. It's just unfortunate, you know. Mm. Uh, so no, I, I don't look back and regret that. It's the manager's got to make a decision. Yeah, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the most patriotic man in the world when it comes to English football. You know, I've got my flags up already, ready for the Euros, to be honest. Uh, I've even got um, some wing mirror socks that I've bought. So you, you haven't? Yeah, I haven't put them on yet, but they're going to go on. There's no doubt about that. Um, Brilliant. So I'm the most patriotic man in the world when it comes to that. So uh, to not get... Pit for England, yeah, of course it's disappointing, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to hold grudges against people and be bitter and twisted about it. Ben had a decision to make, and I wasn't involved in that. It's not a personal decision against me. Um, it's a football decision, and there's other streak strikers that were, you know, regular European Cup players, and you know, live regular scores in the Premier League season in season out. Your Robbie Fowler's, your Andrew Coles, your Teddy Sheringham's, mm. your Andrew Shearer's, you know, so. It is what it is. No regrets whatsoever. I did my best to try and get a call up, but it didn't happen. Now, have you had enough talking about the gloves, or should, should we move on from the gloves? Or do you want? To... I get reminded of that all the time. It's great. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. It was just bizarre. You. All you wore was a pair of gloves. You'd think you were wore. I don't know what. If you wore them on your head or something, we might have all. But it's suddenly. I think Planet Blue, or whatever it's called, there must have sold thousands of them. Well, I, it's strange because I, when I watch a football game now, as you know, I say I analyse it and dip it differently than a fan would. I actually look around and see who's got gloves on with with a yes. t with with um with a t shirt with a sorry short sleeve shirt on, and there's quite a few, you know. So I'm wondering, has it caught on even now? You're so a pioneer. Players, so <laughs> no, but I did. Did I, what did I do at the time? I did it because I hated wearing long sleeve shirts. Didn't like wearing them. Um, so the fact that I wore a pair of gloves, and I very rarely took a throw in, by the way, 
because gloves don't help with throwings because they're quite slippery. So we're very, very ready to a throw in. So it didn't affect that side of my game. Whereas if you're full back, I think you've got to wear gloves. I think they brought gloves out eventually where they had a bit of grips on them. So you can yeah. throw, throw in and wouldn't slip out your hands. So, uh, yeah, I just did it because to keep me a bit warm, you know, it's the honest truth. And then it caught on, as you, as you, as you know. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and the honest truth is I haven't wore a pair of gloves with a T-shirt probably since those games <laughs> walking around where I live. I haven't. So, uh, yeah. I'd like to feel I'm like I'm a I'm I'm I remember we played Tottenham one Boxing Day. I think it was a Boxing Day morning or something or, or around Christmas. And it was it was bloody freezing. And I think we beat them 3 0. It, um, it was on TV and you had your gloves on then, I think. And I, I thought that was, yeah. Re, you, you, to be fair, you actually look, really looked the part then with that on that freezing cold day. Oh, I bet I did, yeah. I bet I did. <laughs> look, anyway, so, yeah. so obviously, dis, I mean, obviously, disappointment to leave Ipswich and, and um, you know, things went, went back. But I mean, moved to a massive club in Sunderland. Um, you know, they are a very big club, but still, of course, bizarrely, still in the same league as Ipswich in League One at the moment. You must you must look at that league and think, you know, known those two clubs so well and thinking, how? You know? Well, I mean, look at Portsmouth as well. You know, mm. they're, uh, I, I, I bet a lot of teams in that league, the likes of uh, Ipswich and uh, Portsmouth, for instance, just to name a couple, um, would have liked Sunderland to have gone up this year, you know, because they're going to be another force next year. You know, Lee, Lee done a great job with them and almost got them up automatically, but they tailed off at the end. So that league's going to be another t- tough league next year. There's no give me in that league. You know, I think she- Sheffield Wednesday down there as well. Yep. So you've got Sheffield Wednesday, you know, um, as well. You've got some massive teams in that league. So it's becoming tougher and tougher, you know. So, um, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I, I can't call it. Okay, it's going to be a tough year for Ipswich. It's going to be a tough year for Portsmouth. You cannot call it. It's the honest yeah. truth. Um, you know, with the changes with Ipswich, the changes at Sunderland, of course, the changes, the manager change at Portsmouth. You just don't know which way it's going to go. And then again, you might get someone like Lincoln who's going to come up and do it again. Mm. Who's to say that they're going to win the final? Exactly. You know? Exactly. I mean, obviously, you know, obviously, you know about Ipswich, Ipswich Town. Obviously, had some big changes. Uh, new owners, new manager, Paul Cook is there. Um, you know, there's a lot going on. Um, it's just a lot. How do you feel as a player? If you, if you, well, there's so much going on at Ipswich. Would you be excited? Would you be worried? Would you be hopeful? Would you be, you know, how how? There's a lot going on, isn't there? So much. Would that disturb you at all, or would you not worry about it? I'd be more worried about the managerial change, because that ultimately is what's going to affect you. If it, if anything's going to affect you, the changes going on at the club, it's it's not on your mind. Um, you know, unless your contract's coming up, but even then it's up to the manager really to say to the owner, I want this key, this player, whatever. So unless you're not asking for silly money, you're going to stay at the club if the manager likes you. So the change, the change of a manager always put me on a back foot. So Paul, Paul's had, I don't know how many games it was, 10, 12 games to, to look at what, so he had a good amount of time to look at the players that he probably wanted to keep on and get rid of. So, when those when that when Paul came in ten games ago, and I would have been a player there, for instance, I would have. That's what I would have been um, concerned about if he would have wanted to keep me on, or if he'd like me as a player, that kind of stuff. The changes at the club, you know, that don't affect me. Like I say, the new owners, it wouldn't have bothered me. Just life goes on. The manager is the one who I've got to impress. I mean, League One finance is obviously crucial. If if I mean, if Ipswich do get the money if, if cook gets the money to be able to to put into big serious transfers can you i mean can you get some seriously you know talented players in can you see ipswich cause they still haven't even been in the playoffs yet in in, the, in this league bizarrely i mean listen paul's got a history of getting teams out of that league um you know your wiggins your portsmouth so big big teams out of that league as well you know teams that have been in the premier league and ipswich is one of those of course so time will tell but I think it's still going to be a tough year for him and the club. I don't. I don't think you can expect things to happen overnight. Um, it depends what players he's bought. In. I, I don't. I haven't seen if he's bought any in or not. So it's, excuse me because I'm. I don't look that that up. But 
he knows the league and he knows who to bring in. So whoever he brings in, whether it's an unknown, whether it's someone who, who's played 500 games, trust him because he's done it before and you've got to give him a chance. And I said this when um, the old manager was there as well. You know, you've got to give him a chance. Yeah. Uh, and that's what you've got to do with Paul. And that's simple. And time will tell. But it ain't going to be no walkover in that league. I, I can tell you now, especially with Sunderland, Sunderland staying down, Sheffield Wednesday coming down, Lincoln, who knows what's going to happen, or one of those who doesn't win the final is going to stay yeah. down. Um, Portsmouth, of course. So Oxford are going to be in it again. Yeah, it ain't going to be an easy league. But Paul knows it. Um, and he's been there before with a big club. So he's got he's got that experience. I know this sounds a bit bizarre, but I mean, and people might say, what a strange club. But it's not. Did you find it easier playing in the Premiership than you did back in the league, in lower leagues? Uh, no. It was, a game was a game. And no, it wasn't, you know, because we played, I think it was, we played in the FA Cup away from home. Well, I think it was, was it Dagenham and Redbridge? We played in the FA Cup. Ipswich Town did, yeah. Yeah, was it Dagenham and Redbridge we played? I think that wasn't Morecambe. No, it wasn't, we weren't there Morecambe, was it? It might have been Dagenham. Morecambe. Was it Morecambe? Played Morecambe as well. Yeah. In that game. So you go to those games and they're just as tough as playing the Premier League games. Mm. You know, they are. You know, you go to Birmingham. When we played, we lost to Birmingham in the in the yeah. League Cup semi-final. They were in the Championship at the time. We were in the Premier League, but they were as tough as it comes. You've got to approach it each, as you would any game. Um, of course, you got the pull of playing against the bigger name teams in the Premier League. But I'm telling you now, this they're just just as tough. You know, you're at their home grounds. The weather's different. The pitches ain't brilliant. You've got to step up. You got you got to work out what type of game it's going to be. Is it going to be a battle? Is it going to be a footballing game? Or are you going to have to play on the counter attack? So all these sorts of things, you have to definitely have to adjust your type of game you're going to play. Um, lower league teams are as tough as Premier League teams. There's no doubt about that. So, but, I mean, when the, the likes of Sunderland obviously not going up, the likes of Portsmouth not going up, Ipswich not going. I mean, these are also clubs that have got very big fan bases. I mean, you know, these they, they can make the, their their grounds rock a bit for, for want of a better word do you think the lack of fans over the last couple you know has that aid is that that certainly hasn't helped clubs like Ipswich and Ports or do you has it played into the hands of lower clubs or or not um I think it's 50 50 I think mm. some players have enjoyed not having the pressure of fans around them and I think those sort of players ain't gonna last long in the game the players that kick on love that sort of whether you're hearing negative stuff from the crowd, because it builds your character. If you've been on a two or three game bad run, you haven't scored a goal for five, six games, and fans are starting to get on your back. It builds your character, and it makes you a stronger person if you get through it. So I think some players have missed it. Some players have loved it. That's what I think. And you'll find out which ones those are next year when the, when the crowds start coming back. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, look at Sunderland the other day. 10,000 home fans against Lincoln. They end up losing a game 2-1. Uh, sorry, mm, winning yeah. one, sorry. Uh, with a penalty miss as well, by the way, from Lincoln. So, you know, it can have the reverse effect. I really think it can do. Uh, so we'll see when it gets back. It'd be interesting to see the stats of last season with no fans in terms of how, how away games went. Mm. Um, because obviously this year it's going to be back to normal again. Hopefully. Because I'm because I must admit, I mean, I don't know about a game, but you, I sit and watch some games on, on telly, obviously with no fans. And the, the, this is just me. This, the passion seems to have been so much less. And, and soon as I think like the FA Cup might be the FA Cup final, it suddenly seemed to completely different game. Suddenly because there was a lot of fans, the, the players just, it just seemed a different game. Well, there's, 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 there's no feed for the emotion, is there? No. The emotional game, there's no feed from the fans to get people emotional. You know, and you have, that's why you have to step up yourself and, you know, mo motivate yourself in some sort of way. So I think you get a feel of the game. Fans get a feel of the game, you know, and whether it's, it's get a bit of a niggly one and they're getting on one or two people's back, getting on, on the referee's back. They're, you know, one player might be annoying the fans and they're getting onto his back, you know, I mean, of the opposition player, I mean. So they create the emotion within the stadium, I think. And it's hard to recreate that as a player when there's no fans in there you, can, you, can't, you kind of feed off each other I think um, and it's been hard to gauge when there's an emotional moment in games with no fans there I think with fans there you know you know instantly 
when there's been a bad foul, you know, instantly when there's been a goal, you know, instantly when referees made a bad decision, because they're they're there, they let you know straight away. That, well, you know that that pricks the hairs upon your back as a player, and it creates an emotion within you. So, I think players have missed that side of it. That's for sure. I know I would, but like I said, I think a lot of players want to hide behind the fact that they don't want any pressure on them as well. And some players want, love it, like I did. Now, how would how how would you how would you have loved VAR, Marcus? Oh shit, sugar. Sorry, um, <laughs> well, it gives me nightmares. I watch it. I'm looking at the other night, the Man United goal, for, for instance, the other night. Yeah. Um, uh, is he offside? Is he not? And, uh, and I'm thinking, I, try, I was trying to put myself in Cavani's shoes. I'm just picking out this moment because it's the most recent game. Yeah. Um, you know, you can see him. He's not celebrating. And you can see when he, the goal was given, he's like, he's just giving, he's just giving it one of them. Because, uh, I don't know. I think it's the right thing to do. I think VAR is, has been right more than it has wrong. Okay? And I like it. But in terms from a striker's point of view, a goal scoring point of view, oh, I don't know. It just it would it would torment me for torment me for five minutes. I don't, and I'm just it'd be wonder it'd be wonder I wonder if we look back and did VAR on my old goals, how many <laughs> offside, and or <laughs> ones that I've had disallowed that should have been onside as well. So it swings and roundabouts. It'd be interesting to to do that one day because unfortunately they're on the list and not going to be clocked off. But yeah. <laughs> I think it's good, but it's definitely um, causes a lot of anxiety to the player that scored a goal, or the team, or the manager that scored a goal, waiting for a decision to be made. Well, that, that'd be terrible, Marcus, if we went back on. Could you imagine if we're sitting in three years' time doing another oh. one? I say, Marcus Stewart played seventy-five games for Ipswich and scored four goals. So let's look for a goal <laughs> in the playoffs. The first one would have been a goal because I didn't handball it. Uh, you know the Bolton goal. Yeah. The second one. Was on side definitely because I've looked across the line, so I've seen it's definitely on side. Uh, the th the one in the final would have been a goal as well, yeah, but because no one else side, good cross and Bam Bam's would have been a goal because I fit on for him and he ran through the defense, so yeah. But you know, you, you can look at things like now, bloody hell, what, what if you know, yes. the goals? I don't know, would, would it have been a free kick for the, what's his name's Holdsworth's first goal in the second leg? I don't know. VAR might have tell you different. It'd be great to go back in VAR and say VAR decisions. You actually wouldn't have gone through on this. That's very. That is that is very true. I mean, could you imagine going back on something at a major final and just saying, "Well, you do realise that two of those goals are offside." Yeah, it'd be bizarre, wouldn't it? Imagine even taking one step further and he actually took the medal away from him and promoted Bolton. That actually now one league. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, that'd be so. Uh, so, there's your football. I mean, your football, your football career was, was was a terrific thing, Marcus. And we all loved it and 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 stuff. And uh, of course, you went into you've, you've gone into coaching and management. Um, you, you said you take the year out right now, but uh, something you're hoping to get back into. Um, or are you are you quite are you quite enjoying the media stuff, Marcus? You, make, well, you have to make a decision, perhaps. I enjoy I enjoy all of it. I enjoyed the coaching. I enjoy, I enjoy being on the grass. I, I did, uh, love that, of course. Uh, I enjoyed the media stuff. Um, I, what I do enjoy the most is, you know, l watching players learn, and especially younger younger players. You know, when they've got a chance and they look at you like little puppies and they want to learn. You know, I I love that kind of feeling and that they want to know more. But whether they whether they ask you questions, I want people to ask me questions. If I haven't got an answer for you, I'll try and get one. Um, yeah, I, I love being in that environment. Of course, that's what I'm used to. Uh, media, of course, it's just. I enjoy doing it. It's not something I, I'm going to do every week. I wouldn't have thought. I wouldn't want to do it every week, if I'm honest. But two, three, once, two, three times a month, great. I, love, love, I enjoy doing it. In terms of getting back into both of them, uh, football, yeah, I'm still. I guess I just said to you earlier really on, my, my, I, I got two boys that play rugby, uh, and I've not been able to watch them play rugby in the last year because of what's happened. That was a part of the reason why I wanted a bit of a break so I can go and watch them because they play on Saturdays. Um, but you know their their season is starting up now, so I get a, I get an opportunity to go and watch that. For instance, got grandparents that are po poorly, so I need to be around for those um, and help out with the family. So all these sorts of things are still got going on. Yeah. But 
if the right thing come up for sure, I'd, I'd do it. But you know, first things first, and family first still at this moment because even though it's a year ago, I've not had a job for, which was my choice, of course. Um, these all everything's been put put back a year anyway. Exactly. So yeah, uh, but I'm enjoying. I, I, I'm busy with life stuff. That's what I am. Now, it's funny you say that rugby because my son played rugby um, as well. And of course, we've got this this great um, argument about rugby refs and football refs, um, mm. and the difference in that the, there is a difference, isn't there, in the way in the way the games are handled, Marcus? Yeah, there is. I mean, I I, I like the rugby refs if I'm honest with you. Even when watching the international games, you know, England or wherever it is, or or or, or the club games, Bristol Bath, wherever I watch, I don't watch it all the time, but sometimes I'll put I'll put them on. If it's an England game, of course, it's going on. <laughs> With me, England's um, socks on your wing mirror. Socks on your wing mirror, of course. Yeah. Um, so it's going on, uh, and I, I, I do. I like I like their mannerisms, and I like the way they talk, and I like the way you know they kind of chat with the player, and they they actually explain the decision why they've done it, and they break it down for the player. Um, and there's no very rarely is there any contesting the referee's decision. Um, you know, so. I don't think it'll ever change in football. I think that's, that's how, how it would be. All I'd like to be is the referees. If, you know, obviously they haven't got the microphones on in football, so you can't really hear them either. You know, whereas in rugby, you, you can hear what they're saying on the TV. But I'd like to think the, ref, the referees I liked were the ones that come over and explain to me. The ones I hated, not hated, that's a strong word, but when I did, the ones I detest, were the ones that would just walk away and not even talk to you, not even give you an eye. And that happened quite a lot with, him, with the games I played. Mm. Try and build a relationship with them from the player's point of view and the referee. Just be normal. Like I'm chatting to you now, mm. just go up to me and say, oh, Marcus, listen, I gave, the, I gave the foul, but I didn't think it was one. I'll mm. have a look at you, but I, I thought I thought he just caught, you just caught the back of his leg. Okay, thanks for letting me know. I don't agree with you, but, you know, I'll walk off. Mm. So, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that happens a lot. I don't know if it happens a lot. On the flip side of it, I also don't know if the players give the referee chance to, to do that because they're in his face so quickly, and he's got to give, book people because he's on a defensive straight away. So I think both are f at fault because referees, I think, need to explain to players more um, clearly why they've made decisions. VAR does that now for them a lot. Um, but also players can help themselves by not being so aggressive in their manner when they got to the referee because straight away he's going to be on the back foot and um, eventually might even get decisions against you in the in, in, within the game in the future of the game, you know, in the last 20 minutes or whatever. So I always like to keep referees on the side because even as a coach I did, because, you know, if, there's, if, you've, if, if you've been on him from the sidelines for, I don't know, however long, uh, uh, for decisions he's made previously in the game, who's to say that in the in in, in the last twenty minutes there's a decision that's gone fifty fifty, and it goes down to the fact that you've actually treated him wrong. You don't know this, of course, but in his mind he's thinking actually that coach has been all right. He's been a bit of a, a bit of a nosy everyone. So I want to give fifty. I want to give it to him. So you, it, you've got to be careful, to beat referees, because it can come down to those situations. They're not going to tell you that, that happens, but I'm sure it, I'm sure it does go through their mind when it comes to a decision they're not sure about. Well, look, that's absolutely right. I think, I think, as you say, the referee, that would be a debate with rugby and football forever and a day. But, um, well, we're coming we're coming not too far short to the end now, Mark, of, of what's been a lovely chat with yourself and catching up on how, I mean, I know you've done lots of podcasts and chats and videos and stuff over the years. Again, as I say, again, just shows, especially here at Ipswich, you're, you're the, the, you know, the, the, the the mark you made in, in, in such a short period of time is it's fantastic um, but let's look let's look forward to the summer because we've got the euros coming up as you said you're a big euro uh, big england fan well we all are big england fans i don't quite go as far as uh, socks on my wing mirrors but i am certainly as very patriotic um your thoughts and marcus um you're seeing the squad probably um there's obviously going to be whittled down but uh, being it being in the home country as well your thoughts my thoughts i think harry Maguire is key to our success I think if he's, he's well, we've got two weeks, two weeks Sunday to the first game. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. I can't see him being fit. I really can't. Even if he is fit, he's not football fit. You know, he's got to get up to speed. So 
I think he needs to be training next week. What's the day? So I, I think he needs to be training by the end of next week or the beginning of the week after, which is leading up to the Croatia game. That's what I think on the Sunday. And then obviously we've got a game on the Friday after and then the Tuesday after that. Um, so he's key. I think what did he do without him? I don't I don't know. I don't know what he's thinking. He's got a few centre-halves, of course. But I'm, but I'm really excited about our forward players we've got here in, in the team. Really excites me. Dominic Carver lewins Lewin's come on leaps and bangs over the past season, uh, season and a half. Um, Harry Kane, of course. You know, our attacking, our attacking lineup's brilliant. I mean, he has to decide. I think there'll be one or two players, you know, maybe Jaden Sancho, um, uh, maybe Greenwood, that might miss out. And you yeah. think, like I said before, it's about the timing. They've just got, there's just, how can you leave Foden out? St you know, you've got Rashford, Sterling. I mean, Mason Mount is the best number 10 in the country at the moment, I think. He's just got energy about him with and without the ball. I I'm excited about that. I think there's goals in us. But, um, you know, I think I think Harry Maguire, in terms of keeping, a, keeping the back door shut and a bit of calmness on the ball and a bit of a man mountain in terms of size of him, Attacking corners, defending corners. I think he's key um, to our and Jordan Henderson a bit, but he's key to our um, our success. And we need luck, of course. You need luck along the way with the penalty shoot. You're going to get a penalty shootout. Stats tells you that on the way to a final, you're going to get a penalty shootout. So you need you need a bit of luck. And let's hope David De Gea is in goal for Spain. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, talking of goalkeepers, actually. Um... Uh, Marcus, uh, yeah, and you're going to Berry. We mentioned Berry going to Berry Football Club la la later next month. Uh, Nick Pope. Now, Nick Pope, um, of course, is missing out. Um, he was actually a, a played for Berry Town. Um, that who, who you'll be going over. Yes, he was at Berry Town before he moved on into the pro game. So um, great stories with Nick. So, um, and here in Suffolk, we're so disappointed for him because he's just he's gone from this non-league level to the top, and he's such a nice top guy. Always got time for the press and th and just just. Feel a bit disappointed for him. He must. He must be a bit gutted. Heartbreaking. I mean, I couldn't. You know, from from my point of view, you know, from not being picked. Okay, fair enough. But from being picked and then that's been taken away from you from injury. Yeah, he would have been a guaranteed number one, number two. Yeah, to, to Pickford and Henderson. That that would have been the three: Henderson, Pickford, Pope. An injury taking taking your dream away from you. You know, which comes around every two years. Luckily, we've got a World Cup next year, which is going to be really strange. A summer of Euros and then a summer of a World Cup. Mm. Um, so luckily, he's got that. But still, you know, from his point of view, injury out of the, out of the Euros. Harry Maguire, done brilliant season. Three weeks to go, four weeks to go, injury, maybe out of the Euros. Henderson, unfortunately, might be coming back. That must be the worst feeling. I've never been in that situation. Um, but... That must be the worst feeling for a professional footballer to miss out on your national team playing in a major tournament. Heartbreaking. I feel for the guy, but luckily he's had time to get over it because it's not as if it just happened and he was in the squad. He's, he's probably known about this operation for a little while. Yeah, very, very unusual for a goalie to get injured um, at such crew. Well, in any, in any point, really, goalies yeah. don't usually um, suffer too, luckily, too much of injury. No, a knee injury as well, which is strange. Normally yeah. you have a gold or, you know, uh, yeah, but I wish him luck, and I'm, I, I do feel for him. For, and honestly. right backs, just while well, we keep just finishing off in the English, I mean, right backs, we've got a plethora of right backs. Walker, oh, but, um, God, I think, I think my team would be if it if it was the game was tomorrow, it would be uh, if Maguire's fit, it would be the right side of um, it'd be the left side of sorry of Maguire and. Uh, and Shaw, because he played for Man United, it'd be the right side of Walker and Stones because they play for Man City. And Shaw and Maguire and Stones grew up as kids together playing similar football, similar teams, similar area. So they know each other really well. And that's a great little mix. You've got your, you've got your little connections on either side and you've got your connection in the middle. In front of them, depending on how attacking you wanted to go, I'd definitely play Henderson at some point. And I met you know what? I really like Jude Benlin. I think he has to be in the squad. Yeah. yeah. Because 
I haven't seen him play before, but when I watched him play against, uh, I think it was Man City in the Champions League, he's a box-to-box player. He, he, he gets in the box and he creates himself chances, a bit like Matty Holland used to do. Mm. You know, you sneak up and get your goal. And we haven't got that in our team, really. We've got Mason Mike that can do that, but he he plays a bit further ahead. And you're always, right, yeah. oh, you know, whereas a, a long-bursting midfield player that wants to run into the box, well, I don't think we've got anyone else like him. You know, you're either holding midfield players of your, um, uh, of your Henderson and your, uh, uh, not Dyer, of course, um, Rice. They, that's their jobs. And then you've got your attack players with um, Mount and whoever else he wants to put in there. But you haven't got a box to box natural one like, like him. So it'd be interesting. I think, I think he should be in the squad and I think he'll get his chance. And I think he, I think he's, he's one for the future. So it'd be Henderson, I think, and, um, Rice, if he's going to play two sitting midfield players, and Mount, Mount ahead of him, along with Harry Kane, Foden on the left, and I think I don't I don't know I'm not sure I put on the right because Rashford's not good on the right, and neither is neither is Sterling. They both like to play off the left, so I'm a bit torn with that one. Uh, but that's for Gareth Southgate to sort out, isn't it? It's quite nice sitting on the armchair to have a chat about it. <laughs> you know, he's under big pressure now. He's got a big decision to make next Tuesday, hasn't he? Because yeah. he's then got a have a squad of twenty six if he wants twenty six. You know, he doesn't. I don't think he has to pick twenty six, does he? Does he? I don't think so. Because Spain picked Spain picked twenty four or something. I don't think he has to pick twenty six. What surprised me if he'd done that, you know? Yeah. Because of already the harmony within the team and keeping players happy. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure it will be. It'd be a great experience. Um, but he's got to manage those players and keep them fit and keep them motivated. So looking forward to the Euros. You're looking forward to the Euros then, Marcus. Yeah, who wouldn't be motivated being, you know, just being in the England team and being <laughs> what wanting to be, you know, if if you're someone like uh, uh, White from Brighton, you didn't even expect to call up in the first place. Yeah, I think you'd just be happy now being number twenty six player just to get the experience and being a, in a party. So I don't think you'll have to worry about keeping him happy. No, so it depends no. how the player kind of looks at it. Um, and no, I'm not looking for the euros. Can you, not, can you tell? I'm not for, looking for <laughs> Well, anyone who's got their socks for the wing mirrors is right up there, ready to go. I, I can't imagine what else paraphernalia you've got. I might even buy a copy of the match and get myself a war chart. <laughs> well, who, who doesn't have, well, who doesn't have a war chart? I mean, it's ridiculous. Marcus, look, it's been fantastic catching up with you. You're always a delight to talk to. And I know the people at Berry, uh, Berry Football Club are going to delightful. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in, in July. Um, so if you haven't got um, if you have, if you want to see Marcus in the person rather than listen to him or seeing him here, he's at Berry, um, Berry Town Football Club uh, in July. So look on their website for that. That's uh, the, 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 uh, the Isthmian League team here in Suffolk. Marcus, thanks for all the, uh, thanks for the chat again. You're always great to catch up with. Um, great memories and great future ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good luck next season to the town. I'll be there at some point.